Yes, you know, you also work at the Chamber of Commerce here in town. So thank you for being here. Thank you for um, having me. Appreciate you your being here. Um, we also have uh, Renee uh, Moorfield, who is the CEO of Wisdom Works, uh, who we will impart wisdom upon you in terms of you know <laughs> culture and, and how to thrive in your environment. And then we have uh, Kelly Heider, I said it right, yes. VP of Innovation at SSPR. You'll learn more about what that means and why that's important. Uh, they, but they are a local PR firm here in town, and they're doing some wonderful things, not just here, but throughout uh, the U.S. And we also have on the very end, uh, we have Nathan Harvey, who is the founding partner of Thrive Consulting Group and is also involved with the Conscious Capitalism chapter based out of Denver. And so, um, and also, he was the one who provided these uh, magazines. So Conscious Company Media is a company based out of Boulder uh, that publishes everything that we're kind of talking about today. And he was kind enough to bring some of those for you as well. So thank you for that. Okay, so um, we're going to jump into the questions here. Renee, you get the first one. Um, based on your experience working with large corporations around the world and running your own conscious business for 20 years, what are the key tenets of conscious capitalism style of leadership? So hopefully you all heard that question. What are the key tenets of conscious capitalis capitalism style of leadership? And I can tell you from prepping for this and doing this work for about 30 years, my notes are many. And so I'm just going to focus on three things that um, that I think across the globe, if you took the if you took the borders away from countries, if you were looking at the globe and you said, let's not look at the borders, what's happening across the globe when it comes to conscious leadership? Um, a couple of things are similar. One is conscious leaders start with a why. And you probably heard this before, just start with the why. What is that core purpose that really inspires you? What would you do? Um, waking up in the morning, whether you were, whether there was a return or not, whether your business had a return or not, what would you naturally do? Um, what would you do to make a difference? Um, and how is that dif how is that difference being made within you? So what I find across um, leaders who are on this kind of journey is that it's a sacred one. Um, they feel it's a it's connected with a spiritual path for them. It feels like they were born to do this. And so that why is really critical. When the world is crazy making, as we all have experienced, and divisive, as we all have experienced, and stressful, as we all have experienced, that why is that source of inspiration and groundedness and the ability to make um, really good decisions. So the why is, is one of those things. Um, the second thing I would say is um, leaders that are on this journey really feel a sense of interdependence. There's not a me and an, 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 an other, there is us. And um, we belong to each other. We are on this one planet together. And so we are trying to uh, create businesses that understand the relationship between one another and between us and nature. So that why becomes critical and that sense of interdependence. You can see that across whole stakeholder systems. One of my favorite stories is the CEO of Interface. Does anyone here know Interface? It's a carpet manufacturer. And probably three decades ago, the CEO, Ray Anderson, who is, who is now not with us, um, was, had a very profitable company, very successful company, totally driven by profitable profit metrics, financial metrics. One day he woke up literally with chest pains and this existential angst of, what have I done? Where do the carpets go? When the Marriott takes my carpets out of the building, where do those carpets go? And all of a sudden started to realize and started to look at that whole interdependence, the whole life cycle, and became very committed to restorative capitalism and as a, as a role model that other companies are now using and very profitable, very successful, very purpose-driven. Um, and the last thing I'll say on my three points, saying in my five minutes that I've been allotted, which I know I'm past, um, the last thing I'll say is leaders on this journey, I don't think this is a journey for the faint-hearted. Uh, leaders on this journey know that there are, our inner game is um, affecting our outer game. If we don't like the results we see in the world, then we've got to change ourselves. So these leaders are willing to look at their beliefs, their biases, their worldviews that are shaping how they show up. And they continually want to 
um, see how they can expand their capacity to act, and that comes through expanding their worldviews. Um, and I guess the fourth thing I would say, the, the driver, I see a common driver, and I, this kind of wraps back to the beginning of the why, is this driver of love. Uh, it's not a word that we use in business, or we didn't used to use in business 30 years ago, and now really understanding that um, love is a source of, of inspiration, Love is a, is a growth mindset when we lead from that place. It engenders growth um, and it is inclusive. So those would be the four things I would say. Fantastic, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, uh, Kelly, next question is for you. Um, uh, you started a conscious capitalism program at SSPR last year. And can you tell us about the programs both for the employees and for the clients that you implemented? Yeah, we did. Um, so our story is maybe a little bit different. Our organization has gone through some um, pretty big changes in the past five years. Uh, we have a new CEO, and with that, there was a bit of a shift in terms of that finding that central point, that why. Um, and so um, as we were, um, I'm part of the executive team, and as we were um, looking at and at that time reworking and, and re-envisioning um, the agency, um, you know, what is working well, how would we change this under new leadership? Um, our CEO, Heather Kelly, um, is a huge philanthropist, is very active in the community, and that's something that is um, uh, very central to her life. And so she wanted to create an environment at the agency um, that engendered that, um, that spirit of giving back. Um, but it accomplished several things. So she did a couple things. Um, we have volunteer time off. Um, was one of the first steps to encourage people to give back. Um, and also, um, instead of giving our clients gifts every year at the holiday, we, get, we donate money on, to a charity of, we choose, they can pick from five. Um, and so we started making small shifts like that. Um, and then Conscious Capitalism came about. We set up um, a team internally called Brand Ambassadors who are in charge of um, keeping the culture consistent. So we're a national agency. We've got four offices across the country. So the Brand Ambassadors keep our culture consistent. Um, and we were thinking about what are the different projects that these Brand Ambassadors can handle and can, can really bring and enhance our, our agency. Um, and so they have taken on the task of building a conscious capitalism program, which looks like right now, or initially, so we've been doing it for a year, we've had three clients in the program, um, six months of um, pro bono PR work, so a lot of that is branding and media relations, um, and uh, we made it our own, and in, in answer to the why, by really taking a moment to define who is at this nexus, so who are those potential clients that we would want to take on in this capacity. Um, we are a female-led agency, so we feel very strongly about um, female leadership. Um, we are known, um, not very well in this community, but on a national scale for um, working with tech, tech companies and tech startups. So we really wanted to be able to work with someone who was doing really innovative and cool stuff with technology. And then the other aspect was that they had to have some kind of socially or environmentally conscious component um, that we could get behind. Um, so when we started looking, we looked locally. Um, our headquarters is in Colorado Springs, and we um, decided on the Alliance Center out of Denver. Um, and so it has been a great experience. The employees have completely driven it. We're a pretty flat structure, so that's been awesome to see. And um, you know, we can talk more about the rewards overall, but it's a great um, training ground. Um, we can get some, some of our newer employees who don't maybe don't have as much experience with client communications in doing in-person meetings with these clients because the stakes are a little bit lower. We have more honest feedback relationships with our clients um, because we they know that we believe in them and we're working together for a cause. Um, and so that feedback, direct feedback about our services helps to improve how we do our business. Um, and then there's another one that I think I forgot. Um, but, oh, and the other one is that we also get to test, it's a testing ground for new service. Um, it's my job to build out new revenue streams, and so we get to test out new aspects of service with these clients. Um, you know, visual branding is a new um, venture for us, and so it's kind of a new um, frontier there as well. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Yep. All right, Yemi, this question is for you. Um, the Wild Goose and Good Neighbors Meeting Houses, at that it shows places of business, you do a very thorough orientation process uh, with all of your staff. 
Could you share with the group here kind of what those key components are and, and the why? Why do you do that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, my business partner, actually I should preface it by saying by no means are we perfect in what we do. We're still trying to get better at what we do. Well, we try, and it doesn't hurt to try. So my business partner, Russ, and I, um, we established very early on that uh, we know why we do what we do, but the question is, do, uh, does our staff know why? Do our customers know why? Do the people around us know why? Because we're trying to develop a whole culture of, of this type of thinking, whether or not we're physically in the location or not. So we have um, a practice where we, what we call a vision training. It happens every couple of months, and all our new staff uh, are required to go through it, and sometimes... Um, we have staff that have been there for a while to actually choose to go through it again. And in this space, uh, we make it fun and lively, and um, one of the core things we do is actually we, we show a video. It's a five-minute mini documentary that tells our story of why. And so in that video, it just kind of journeys um, through the rest of my story from the moment we we decided this is what we want to do, and that whole process, the ups and downs of it, and how the community rallied around us, and it takes through, you know, kind of the what happens in the in the meeting house, and uh, the staff gets to watch this, and they actually have a, a sheet of paper that they afterwards they get to answer questions, and some of the questions are just fun. Uh, for example, one of the questions is, "What color of hat am I wearing?" Um, <laughs> and all the way to what types, what types of values do you see that come up over and over um, as you watch the video? And then we ask them questions, how do you see yourself fit in this, in this story? And these are the type of questions that we ask them. Then we discuss it as a group. And I got to tell you, almost every time, many of my staff would tell me they've never worked in a place like this that actually tells them why. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that they realize that they're part of something bigger. And one of the things we're trying to show them is that um, what we do is a means to an end. Every single task, every single thing we do is a means to an end. And so in a sense, we're just flipping the script. So perhaps they're used to uh, an environment where money is the end goal. So what we're trying to teach them is that we, we, uh, money leads to something bigger. And what is it? And what is it for them? And I'll get back to that in a second. And so I even I even share even my own personal story. I said, you know, I tell tell them tell them about how uh, on the weekends I, I watch the numbers and the finances. And believe me, I, I do not enjoy it, but I do it because we have to be a successful business because our community needs us alive. We cannot close because of who we are and what we do and what we represent in the community. So it's an environment to, to tell them why, but also to invite them to be a part of, of this whole journey and to keep this culture alive and well. And I got to tell you, they, they do a fantastic job because we find out that even our regulars know why. And our regulars mm -hmm. begin to act as staff people and care for other customers. And so, um, so for example, um, in a name, Meeting House, so Wild Goose Meeting House, Good Neighbors Meeting House, one of, the, one of the core things we also teach them that even in the name that we've chosen is a why. So it's a story that tells them Meeting House is our way of reestablishing this ancient word of public house that we find that, that goes all the way to the Roman era, which were third places in the center of community where people, if they're not at work in the first place, or, uh, are not at home the first place, or the work the second place, they went to this third place a community gathering place. And so we want to tell the story of being a community gathering place. So we say things like conversation is a main activity. And so we, 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 we talk about these type of things. And so um, our mission statement, just so you guys know, is we create community over good food and beverages. Mm -hmm. So that's in the why. So do we, do we do food and beverages? Absolutely. But you see, the, you see how we flip the script? We create community over good food and beverages. And I'll end with this. Um, one of the things we do in that vision training is also, is also to establish their why. So we say things like, if you're with us after two years and you don't really have another plan, we're going to be sitting with you and trying to help you figure out what's next for you in your life. Because we know we have 
a lot of young people in their mid-20s, and this is not a permanent job, and we want to see them succeed. Mm -hmm. And so we're working actively on a development plan of what is the next step for them, because we, we have some that have gone on to open their own coffee shop. Many of them were managers to take on other manager jobs, and so we're actively pursuing their why, and by the way, which allows them to be deeply invested in the time they're with us, mm -hmm. because they understand their why today and their why in the future. And I'll stop there. All right, Nathan, uh, representing Conscious Capitalism uh, Colorado chapter, what do you believe is the power of the Conscious Capitalism movement? And can you tell us a few things about our, what our own Colorado chapter is doing and how we participate in that movement? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, the power of the Conscious <coughs> Capitalism movement is succinctly said this way. Uh, the workplace is the single greatest organizer of human effort in modern society. Uh, it has long since transcended government or religion. Uh, the workplace defines what the vast majority of people around the world do with their time every day. And if that effort can be harnessed, not just for making money, but also for achieving the elevation of humanity, in the words of uh, John Mackey, um, that is the potential of the conscious capitalism movement. Is that could get everybody working on making this world what we wish it could be. So that's the potential. Um, <laughs> just, just, just tiny. <laughs> if you care about that. Unlimited potential. Low bar. Maybe that's the right. other way is later. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the con so just if, if I can provide just a little bit of background about the structure of the formal movement, um, there is a uh, an international organization called Conscious Capitalism International. It's headquartered in San Francisco. Um, uh, uh, John Mackey and Raj Sisodia, the co-authors of Conscious Capitalism, are board members of this organization, but it's run by professional staff. Uh, there are, my numbers are a little off, so don't quote me on this, but it's uh, close to 30 chapters in the United States. Uh, and there's uh, another eight or nine countries that have active chapters in them. Uh, it's 15 or 16 international chapters at this point, so a few countries have multiple chapters. Um, the chapters vary in their size and heft, if you will. Uh, some of the more successful ones are in like Chicago and Houston and Dallas and Arizona. Um, Colorado is a relatively small uh, chapter still, so uh, it's it's not uh, it, it's not. We, we don't pull much weight yet. Um, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of it. It's been kind of uh, uh, tripping along for four or five years. Um, the major problem with the chapter model uh, is, is just the, the membership model. Uh, it's difficult to figure out how you provide um, uh, value for members in something that's as theoretical as conscious capitalism without getting into actual specific consulting services or something like that. And so all of the chapters around the country are struggling with this unless they are headed by uh, people that have already achieved some renown as business people in their communities. Uh, they tend to have the ability to make a couple of phone calls and raise a $60,000 annual budget just with some sponsorships so they don't have to mess with the membership model, right? So this is something that many folks can relate to, I'm sure. Um, uh, but that's, uh, that's, where, uh, that's where Colorado is. Now that said, um, the chapter has found a bit of traction working with business schools around the state. Um, uh, there is a, a, a program called the Foundations of Conscious Business that was produced by Conscious Company Media. Um, I perform it. Um, it's an on-demand course, 90 minutes, it's all filmed, uh, but that as an offer for business schools has been kind of interesting. We've had three or four business schools around the state uh, bite on having that as a, a little curriculum that they can use uh, that they don't, you know, they pay 10 bucks a seat for each student, which is a lot cheaper than adju an adjunct professor. Um, so that's something that maybe is a spark of hope that we're making some impact. Um, but that's, uh, that's where things stand right now with the Colorado chapter. Um, it is a Colorado chapter, though uh, we don't have any representation in the Springs. Um, I'm not even an active board member anymore, but none of the active board members could come down today, happened to work with my travel, so I swung in. Uh, but if there is anybody that's interested in uh, trying to get something rolling in the Springs, ideally in partnership with the uh, Institute for Social Impact, um, I would be very happy to put you in touch with the current board member. Fantastic. 
<laughs> a lot of things to think about, right? Okay, so uh, these next questions are, you know, obviously this is for the group, and you know, please, you know, keep your answers. One minute is the goal, right? But you know, a little flexibility. Two. I'll try. Right. That's right. Okay. So for everybody, uh, first question is this: Why do you think that businesses should even have a social impact component to them? What's the importance of that? I'll go ahead and answer. That. <laughs> I, first of all, I think it's the right thing to do, but that's not, that doesn't sell. But I, I, do, I, do, I do think it's the right thing. It worked for you. It did, it did work for me. Um, it's the right thing to do. But even beyond that, I think there's a demand for it. Um, you mentioned that uh, one of my primary work is I work with the uh, Colorado Springs Chamber of Commerce and Economic Development Corporation, nicknamed Chamber and EDC. My role is to, I work with a lot of local industries and business executives trying to find ways to help them grow and work on their behalf to, to improve our business climate. Um, one of the things that we, that uh, it seems like a reoccurring conversation to have with many of them include workforce, um, the workforce issue and the challenge they have with the emerging and a new workforce and that whole generation. And um, the businesses that get Conscious capitalism have no problem with the workforce and even the business culture. The businesses that don't have this imagination are the ones that struggle and many times trying to um, still employ old methods into this new day, um, new new way of um, the new business economy per se. So one of the things I'm constantly challenging business executives is to perhaps rethink how to even hire. And what, I'm, what I mean in this particular case is that when um, the days of where you just hired uh, an employee and you just said, this is your job, just do it, those days are over. Now you have to explain why. Mm -hmm. And the companies that actually explain why, they're bringing a young, talented person and, and goes, well, the product that you're making ends up living in another product, and at the end of the day, it goes up in space and it keeps us safe. Or well, the product that you're making ends up in this other product and then it goes into the human body and helps keep somebody alive. And those type of conversation is what makes those young people come alive and they see that there's, an, there's something bigger. You know? So it's, just not, it's not just a monotonous task or something they have to do. They realize that their job, no matter how menial it is, makes such a big difference. It could be saving someone's lives. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that, gosh, it's, it's a way of the future. And the businesses that I understand is, uh, are leading the way and they don't have any problems with workforce. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to just add because I would like ditto, 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 ditto everything <laughs> you just said. Um, and our work with, from Wisdom Works is to work with global companies around the world. And um, we find in global companies the exact same thing. The attraction of talent is a big issue. But it's also that people, people if at the workplace, there's such a sense of fragmentation, disconnection, mm -hmm. loneliness, disengagement at work. I mean, really, we are at an all-time high in the US. It's, I think it's about 85% of employees in global companies. That's huge. And that's a Gallup, Gallup well-being index metrics that you can look it up. It's huge. So we've got this level of disengagement. And the moment that a company begins to shift toward whether they call it conscious capitalism or a more responsible business, whatever they term it, more effective organization. I, I, I told Jonathan and um, Stacy, I think when we get to the point where we stop using conscious and realize this is just about doing good business, <laughs> that yeah. we'll really know that a shift has been made. Um, the level of engagement that helping people be inspired by the mission of an organization, but also tap into their own mission as well, and see that work can be a place where people leave more refreshed, more well, more developed than when they came. That as a role of a leader, we should be creating conditions where people leave as um, the grandest versions of themselves, Absolutely. not burn out. So it's that shift when a company makes that type of shift, and that is not easy in a global corporation. One company we work with is in 206 countries. Imagine all the complexities with that. Um, you've got the national culture, you've got the country culture, you've got the tribes. It's just a fascinating, and yet 
it is happening, we are in the process of that movement. So that would be another reason is the people that are at work is really re-engaging. And I'm gonna add one more thing too, because we're saying the same thing, <laughs> is that um, it affects the bottom line. The studies that after studies that are also sure. showing that mm -hmm. that type of culture versus companies that don't have a culture, they actually, the companies that do it well, that have this type of thinking, actually make more money, which is- um, Across so, the board. Yeah. Yeah, all the metrics are showing that, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Yeah, um, I think, uh, yeah, so same, same. And, <laughs> and then um, it, I think it does a couple of things. So um, it helps with retention. It helps with loyalty. Um, I think that any time you can connect your brand to your employees, it's the shift from traditional business to a more socially driven enterprise or a social enterprise where employees have more weight in terms of how they they move the values of the companies that they work for. Um, and I, I don't, I'm a millennial, I'm a, like an elder millennial, I, <laughs> but um, so I, I don't want to take credit for that, but I think that the millennial workforce has really stepped in to help with that shift. And the majority of, of the employees at our agency are millennial or Gen Z, and they care very much. It comes up in 90%, we've had a hiring blitz this year, and so I've done a lot of interviews and it comes up in almost every interview. Mm -hmm. So like over 90% of interviews, they talk about conscious capitalism, they see it on the website, they appreciate that we have a mission, they understand our values because they're translated through the work that we're doing through that program and they align with them and they, and they want to come in and be a part of that. Um, and that's something that, you know, particularly with our model and we're refreshing every six months with different clients that they will be able to have purchase in that and feel like they're invested in that for as long as they're with the agency through their development. Um, and so then we don't have to worry about hiring more people mm -hmm. um, every cycle. And the, you know, they, it just contributes to that longevity and that sense of community because we're able to gather around values. And we have had that experience transitioning so far from where we were as an agency before our leadership shift to now new CEO and just a very much more social enterprise model um, is a happier culture um, and people are much more engaged. The other thing that I would add is uh, uh, if you look at, I think, I think the earliest record we have in modern society of there being a corporation uh, was in England to build a bridge. And once the bridge was built, the corporation dissolved because its task was complete. And that was the way that corporations were. We would incorporate to achieve a specific objective, and with the objective completed, the corporation would dissolve, its work was done. Uh, and at some point, we got into this thing that the survival of the corporation was purpose enough, mm -hmm. and the profit of the corporation was purpose enough. And that is, I think a step too far from what the societal justification for a corporation is. And so why we need to get back to conscious capitalism is again, uh, existence in and of itself is not, uh, is not good. It's not <laughs> virtuous, it's not just. Uh, it's, it's the reason the thing exists that gives it its societal license. And uh, the, the, the perpetual survival of large companies or small companies or nonprofits uh, is is uh, I think uh, uh, a perversion of why the thing should exist and so if we can all be clear about that about the goal that there is to achieve um, I think that that solves a whole lot of other problems um, and the best way to achieve said goal mm -hmm. is all of the cultural stuff that was just mentioned mm -hmm. That's a good point fantastic mm -hmm. all but I want no pressure everybody out there, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start doing this soon, I hope. Some of you already are. <laughs> but, so uh, yeah, this fantastic answer. Love it. Uh, next question. What are the opportunities that you see that are starting to emerge now or may have been around for a while, a while in this new sector of the economy? Opportunities. Um, I can go. So for us, I think that we've had we've realized some opportunities um, as a business through this. Um, we have found partnerships with other organizations um, who understand our mission and want to work with us. So we have found um, some opportunity there. 
um, opportunities with hiring and retaining top talent. That's fantastic also. Um, but I think that the biggest thing for us is the opportunity to be a part of something really cool. So when we choose clients, because we do hand pick them when we do a lot of research and we have in, an interview process where we meet with them and talk to you know potential candidates and then we make a selection. Um, but it's our chance. We work with startups all the time. We know how hard it is to build a brand, even when you have tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in funding. Um, but for those who aren't quite there, um, you know, it it enables us to just identify like cool tech. We're tech nerds. We love cool technology, and we get to say this is something that is very helpful and useful. Um, it's in it's environment. It has an, a strong environmental purpose, or it has a strong humanitarian purpose, and um, it's also you know female led, or you know has that connection, or whatever it is that those values are that we hold, um, and how they connect to that particular company. Um, and we've kind of. Um, run a bit of a gamut with the three um, companies that we've worked with so far, but um, we get to impact the industry that we're working in on a day-to-day -day basis and invest our time and resources into technologies that we think are going to make a huge impact. And for us, that's really rewarding. And for the industry, that's really rewarding. Um, because these things get out there and they get heard and they get better funding, um, hopefully. From our from our aid, so yeah. I, I will I, I will follow because um, I think it builds on what you're what you're saying because it's about technology. When I was thinking about this question, one of the movements I see happening that I'm probably just make really excited about is the whole trans tech movement, uh, and that is the movement to use technology to support emotional well-being and f human flourishing. And there is just a whole, I, I have been kind of tracking it over the last few years because it's been pretty early on, but it is growing like crazy. I just interviewed um, a couple of days ago a woman named Nicole Bradford, and she is head of a trans tech academy and, and really spearheading the movement with a number of other people in the U.S. and, and globally. And um, we had this conversation about artificial intelligence and how in 10 to 15 years the bill will come due that artificial intelligence is going to automate more and more jobs. And as it automates more and more jobs, if we are not help supporting people in finding a new kind of fulfillment and work on emotional well-being and interpersonal well-being, we will have jobs automated, you know, jobs lost, and then there, and within that massive fear, there's going to be some significant political, you know, political problems, societal problems. She said, but the opportunity we have right now is to use technology to scale new practices for emotional, social well-being and human flourishing. So she just gave me a whole different perspective, <laughs> which was just a really incredible perspective. The other thing that I'm super excited about is most Fortune 500 companies these days have some sort of a, a mindfulness um, practice, some sort of training to build mindfulness skills. And I think some of them are doing it lip service, like it's, you know, you do your little 10 minute practice and yep, check, that, check the box, check the box initiatives. We've done that a lot. But I also think um, we're seeing so much evidence of how it improves our lives when we slow down, when we take a breath, when we pause, and when we move from a generative orientation rather than a reactive one. And sometimes, it's within us already to move from compassion and, and generativity, but we have to pause sometimes to reconnect with that. And so I'm excited about what's happening across uh, global companies because I think it can support us in being better people for each other. So those are the two opportunities. Fantastic. That's good. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go next. And a couple of things I, I do want to share. One of the things that we didn't see coming in, Russ and my story was how having a conscious capitalist imagination would lead to a place where what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we don't really do much with regards to market in our organization. Hmm. So it's not, it was, it was almost, we didn't see it coming, but um, we don't, we barely spend money in marketing because the business itself, markets itself, our, our customers, or ambassadors, so you create that brand 
ambassadors and any, anywhere from your staff who are recruiting their fellow staff people to come there so it becomes easier to recruit then you have the customers who are telling each other and so really we only advertise out of goodwill because we want to just nurture that relationship with the independent and but we do not pursue any kind of advertising so it's really mm -hmm. been a huge opportunity for the businesses because of who we are and the uh, the ethos, the ethos that follows the, both of our businesses. So that's been a huge op opportunity. The second one for me is, um, and we were just talking about this before we started, I, I think to be able to make money and make an impact at the same time, it doesn't get any better. Mm -hmm. It's usually one or the other. You know, it's either you have this hungry capitalist who don't really care about anybody or you just want to make money, make money, or the other extreme is that, you know, you're deeply involved in social issues and, and the people, but is it possible to have both? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a sweet spot, too, because we do want to make a living. Making money is not a bad thing because it really provides jobs and provides income for one's family and improves quality of life. At the same time, you are going to your deathbed knowing that I impacted so many lives, which at the end of the day, which is where we all, all we all want, and at the bottom, of the, at the depths of who we are, because when we know, we go to all those funerals, and no one ever talks about how much money you made. It's all about the stories of the lives impacted, and I just love that you can have both of those um, in your work experience. So I'd say those are the two opportunities right. for, for me. Um, just briefly, uh, there's a local celebrity chef in Dallas named Chad Hauser. A few years ago, he was invited by a nonprofit to teach some kids from the county juvenile jail to make ice cream at the Dallas County Fair. And he was expecting these kids to be pretty difficult to work with, but he found that they were absolute sponges. They wanted to be able to do something like this. They wanted to be seen and loved and believed in. And Chad had such an amazing experience with them, uh, he decided to open a new restaurant in Dallas that would have a one-year internship for kids coming out of juvenile detention uh, that would help them to get the skills they need to get placed in not like Wendy's and fast food, but at some of the finest restaurants in Dallas. Mm -hmm. It's called Cafe Momentum. It's been open for three years, and Chad has uh, reduced the recidivism rate among those kids in Dallas County by 44%, uh, and he's just getting started. Um, that's a, uh, if, you, if you figure that the, the usual life path for folks that are in juvie is that half of them spend the rest of their lives in and out of prison and the taxpayer cost of all that, Chad has saved the county of Dallas $250 million already. <laughs> and so the opportunity and the thing that I'm excited about is folks like you doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I want to give everybody an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so I hope you have been thinking about uh, something to ask folks. Um, and for folks that would like to do that, what we'd ask you to do, not to be formal or anything, but so that we can get capture the question on the live stream, just come up here to the mic and just kind of speak into it so we can get folks who are listening from uh, around Colorado a chance to hear the question. But um, please, folks, if you've got a, have a question for this fantastic panel, I mean, we've already had a really, really good discussion, but we want to hear from you too. This is why we do these smaller groups, is to hear from the community and get some dialogue going. So, if you'd like to come up, right? Come on up. You knew I had a question. I know you did. <laughs> 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 yeah, so quick comment. What an amazing panel. Oh, My thank word you. is, without being born. <laughs> What's your name, young lady? Mine? No, the one oh. you see you. Re Renee. Younger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well Renee, played. Renee Morfield. <laughs> Renee. Yeah. I, I wanted to say this, that I read widely on this subject, and I listen intently on this subject because it's so very, very important to me across the spectrum of business. Your opening four comments mm -hmm. were the most powerful that I've heard since mm -hmm. I've gained interest in this in, in social mm -hmm. capitalism, oh, in social consciousness. So my question to you is, are you summing up this movement by saying it can't be achieved with IQ, but it can only be achieved by a heart motivation? Mm -hmm. Um, wow, what a great question, <laughs> and thank you so much. Um, it can't be IQ-led, 
for sure. I still think we need IQ. We, we, we still need our, our, our heads, but we need our hearts and we need our, our intuitions as well. I would say heart and kind of a whole sense of us. Um, I think there is so much that each one of us know, again, when we stop and pause, um, information that we get from our bodies and our intuition that we can also be leading with. Um, we know when there's good energy, think about when you walk into a room and you have a feeling of the goodness there, the palpable goodness, mm -hmm. or wow, something bad just happened here. So we know that we, um, we know that we can be an invitation for each other to thrive. We know we can be that kind of energy for each other. And so the, to me, the, the leadership of this is how can I every day commit to that personally, but how can we as a collective leadership, the problems in the world that we have today won't get solved by me or her or him, it will be a we. So how do we also commit to that kind of energy? So, I don't know if that answers your question, but. It, it sums it up well. How can you get those four opening statements to us? No one could write that fast. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're, we're recording that. It's on recording. <laughs> it's on recording. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just add one, uh, one thing. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, overlap and similarity between a lot of the spaces here. And uh, the, 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 the technical way that conscious capitalism teaches leadership uh, suggests that IQ is relatively fixed, uh, and so there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Yeah, but but there's there's other skills that are very yeah. very growable, mm -hmm. and yes. one of them, uh, the the three that they actually define conscious leadership with is emotional intelligence, which everybody has some understanding of, spiritual intelligence, which is very much what Renee mm -hmm. was talking about, and then also systems intelligence, which is uh, kind of like uh, just really understanding the way that things impact each other. Uh, both from a strategic, like mm -hmm. how are you going to mess with this system to achieve the better outcome, and also from just an awareness of if I take this action, what are the ripple effects likely to be? Mm -hmm. So, so just to 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 uh, put a fine point on that, that's that's technically conscious capitalism's definition for conscious leadership. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Perfect. Fantastic. Other question? Hi, I'm Chris. Um, I'm a new resident here, and this is my first opportunity to come to an event around here. I really enjoyed listening to you guys. You had a lot of great ideas, and um, I'm interested in entrepreneurship, so that's one of the particular reasons I'm here. Uh, my question is maybe a bit broad for you guys, but my question is, what do you guys mean by capitalism, and how does this movement I differ from conscious socialism, for example, or conscious fascism, any of the other alternative theories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me, let me uh, kick off, if I may, on this one. Um, I, I think that conscious fascism might be an oxymoron, <laughs> except for so those true. who are perpetrating the fascism, right? If they're doing it very intentionally, then I suppose all fascism would be conscious in that respect. Yeah, but that's a good point. We're, 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 oh, uh, that's I, deep. I, yeah, I would, I would say that, uh, that, that that's, that's different. But I think the main thing that you might be getting at, and I think the thing that, that hangs up a lot of people when we talk about conscious capitalism, is capitalism versus like a social democratic, uh, because if we're talking about this kind of capitalism, which uh, I think would flatter itself that this is a, a benevolent kind of capitalism, that it really is focused on uh, creating uh, the greatest good for the greatest number, but we do that through for-profit business, which is not usually what people think of when they think of capitalism. Yeah. They think of robber barons and more for me and F you and <laughs> like that kind of capitalism, right? And I think that when you say capitalism, that's still the dominant narrative of what capitalism is. Mm -hmm. What conscious capitalism would argue, especially if the alternative presented is something like socialism, uh, is that if you look at uh, the... the um, Raj Sisodia does this amazing keynote where he, he, he shows like the index of people living in what we would consider to be abject poverty, uh, like under $2 a day globally, right? Uh, if you look at the percentage of humanity and the raw numbers of humanity that were in that situation in like 1800 versus the number of people that are in that situation today, uh, there is uh, tremendous 
uh, 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 progress uh, in terms of material wealth and well-being, quality of life, if you're measuring things like the incidences of starvation and uh, the curable diseases and all those kinds of metrics that I think you'd want to look at there. Um, it is, they argue, capitalism that has been the driver of the innovations and the delivery of products and services to the number of people around the world that has achieved that kind of human progress. Now, if, if you accept that definition and you accept the ethic of capitalism that we're talking about here, I think that that's what we're calling conscious capitalism. Mm -hmm. But the other kind of capitalism that's still part of the popular nomenclature is what I think we would say unconscious capitalism. So the power of the tool and the system is there if it can be used consciously, but unconsciously, it's also the perpetrator of tremendous wrong. And, and I think that's the thing that we're trying to get people more conscious of so that we can stop doing the bad stuff and really focus on how do we increase the impact that capitalism has had for, again, the elevation of humanity. Um, I think that Yemi put it really well earlier when um, he made the point that in, in this capitalism model, you're making more, more profit providing more opportunities for other people. So developing more leaders with similar ethics um, and, and hiring more people and, um, and having the ability to do more good. So while our, to use us as an example, while our conscious capitalism program is quite small right now, as we grow as an agency, I fully expect that we'll be taking on more and more clients um, in that capacity and, and being able to um, amplify the amount of good and the impact that we're having in that way, that we can only really sustain through a model of profit. I would add just to kind of summarize too. I mean, I would kind of you know summarize it this way in the sense of it's using the powerful economic engine of capitalism as you described, not just simply for gain but also for good. So you're using it to do that because it is. It's a it's a powerful powerful tool, but we're only using it on a certain piece. And so it's like if we broaden that definition of business success, that's that's the vision that we have here. Um, that's a powerful thing that will create more opportunity for for folks. Another question? How's my hair look? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, panel. <laughs> um, I am a millennial, so, um, and even my sister is even younger than me, and she's even worse as a millennial. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I just want to know, how do you get started? Like, as a millennial, there's a lot of social things going on. It's a lot of things are like, rah, rah, yeah, we're going to be part of everything, but there's... <laughs> We can't be a part of anything. Mm -hmm. So how will we start? Like, where's, where's the first, what's the first step to take? Uh, for me, it's starting with your why. I mean, it's really super simple and difficult. Yeah. And really starting with your why. Like, what, what is it that wakes you up in the morning that you would do regardless? Mm -hmm. As far as a, and, and business is an avenue to do that. Mm -hmm. But just really getting clear about your personal, as a leader, as a human being, what is that why that inspires you? And I would start right there. And I think for, for many organizations, um, the organization exists a while and then they have to retrofit. Then they have to figure out, oh my gosh, we've, our, our why is wayward. Mm -hmm. I know a lot in the healthcare industry that's happened a lot where healthcare systems were originally about health and healing, mm -hmm. but often have become about um, just making money and just working with the, with the ill mm -hmm. versus it's supposed to be a place of health and well-being. Yeah. And so getting that why, getting lost, um, is common. So I would I'd fundamentally start there. And I want to build on what Renee, Renee said. I, your why is, is it. It's, it's everything. Um, I've heard it said that the two most powerful discoveries uh, is the day you were born and the day you discovered why you were born. I love that quote. Um, that, is, that is it. Um, my personal mission statement is to collaborate for the health, growth, and prosperity of Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. That's what gets me up in the morning. Now, it looks like place-making entrepreneurship, so uh, a couple of cafes. Mm -hmm. It also looks like working with business executives and mm -hmm. down. It also looks like working with Pastor Ben and a nonprofit initiatives. And, mm -hmm. But um, I... I I was walking back to the office and I ran into an old intern who is now a friend and we just catching up on, on, on the sidewalk and asked how things were going and she said, well, I'm not quite sure because she works in a fantastic organization. Things are not, I'm kind of unsure right now and 
perhaps I might be there for a year, I might be moving on, mm -hmm. but I just feel restless. Then I said, um, well, do you know what you want to do, do next? She said, I, I have no idea. I said, well, what's your it? She's like, what do you mean by it? You know, why, why do you get up in the morning? Mm -hmm. And she goes, I, I really don't know. And I said, okay, actually things are working hard right now for me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some uncertainties. But I've been able to make the most of it because, you know, the uncertainty of work was never it for me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, um, there, because I know how to work within, I still know how to do that conscious capitalization in the midst of uncertainty. So I, I feel like that is truly your center. Mm -hmm. When you know why, then you begin to be able to make those decisions of um, how you work within your current context, even though it's not ideal, mm -hmm. it informs where you go next. It informs, you know, if you decide you want to start something, what you do start, and when you become a leader and leading other people, and how you how you organize your organization and develop other people and empower other people and work with people in the community. It is it just manifests itself in every single aspect of life. So mm -hmm. what you're saying, Renee, is mm -hmm. really important. I think that's where it starts with. Mm -hmm. I think as far as um, like the workforce and entering the workforce, um, you said your sister's younger also. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, I think it's, it is important to, um, to look for um, a work that, that is fulfilling in some way and that does feed that why. And um, you know, it might not look exactly like you would ideally want it to. And I think that having that, that North Star you know, that, that guidance, you know, being really honest with yourself about whether that's being fulfilled. Because what I'm doing right now is definitely not what I ever thought I would be doing, yeah. but, but I do, I, you know, I have that. You know, it, it, that fulfillment exists, and as long as that is there, then, um, then you know, satisfaction is, exists, and, and I feel, um, feel good about where things are at. Yeah. But... I had to find a place and make some space, you know? It's like collaborative. Mm -hmm. Help me and I will also create and make space and, and do something uh, in return. And I think I might have a little bit of a different take on this one. What, what are you doing right now? Um, go to school, I work for my parents' business, they are entrepreneurs with themselves, but my major is inclusive early childhood, which is very different from the restaurant business. Yeah. So, yeah. And why inclusive early childhood? Like I said, the children are why I on this earth. I don't know what part, I, maybe all of it. That's, mm -hmm. that's probably why I can't keep still. <laughs> I do all of it, but <laughs> children are why I'm here. Totally. And so uh, the, the, <clears throat> I had a chance to talk with uh, Raj Sisodi about this one time, and he, he, he took the Joseph Campbell quote about follow your bliss, mm -hmm. right? That Campbell late in his life actually said, it's not follow your bliss, it's follow your blisters. It's not like, oh, it's euphoric. It's hard work, right? And so, so you, you sort of got a why yeah. in terms of like you want to you wanna do something with kids that's yeah. going to help, right? And yeah. so if you go the blisters route on that and flip it around, there's something up that makes the kids need your help. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's that? Interesting. Okay. Right? And so I'm saying there, there, is a, there is a system at play that has the current status quo be suboptimal in your opinion. Mm -hmm. And so you could look at and, and define the scope however big you want, mm -hmm. but you could look at specifically what is the thing that would need to shift yeah. for the result to be something that you would consider acceptable. And to just give you a, a, a bigger, like an example there, um, Seth Kelly is the guy who runs base camp up in Fort Collins. Okay. 3,000-ish kids uh, work with him. They go do, like, after-school program for what, you know, the latchkey kid, right? So they do hours in the morning, hours in the afternoon to fill the gap of the difference between the school day and the work day, no. right? And so Seth and I were talking about this, and they've got great services and awesome, and so you could start a nonprofit like that and do that, yeah. and that would be an awesome way to do it, but that's still the symptom that you're addressing, and it's not actually solving the core problem, mm -hmm. right? Because the core problem is that we've got this problem where folks can't be at home with their kids because yeah. they're either working two jobs or just the normal work day doesn't align. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at it from a system structure perspective, the way to fix that is to align the work day and the school day. Mm -hmm. 
then you have a different set of problems about making sure that parents are going to be good to kids and all that. And if you want to tackle that one, that's fine too. <laughs> but, 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 the, uh, but, but the thing is, the more specific I think you can be, so you've got your why. Mm -hmm. The next step I think is, what's the specific system? Then how are you going to mess with that so that we actually create a better outcome? No, and and, so, good. and like that's it. where the value proposition for a business is, mm -hmm. right? And so, so it's not just the intending to do good or you jumping in and being of service, and you should, mm -hmm. but if we're really able to use our full creativity here, it's about how are we actually gonna solve this problem, no kidding around, like once and for all, not just That's address the problem. symptoms, but what is the specific place in the system right now that you wanna go to work and I think that if you play with that question for a little bit, you might find some operation ability. I'm gonna give you a high five. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, so we've got two minutes left, which means you get 30 seconds now for the last question. Mm -hmm. But I think this will be a good one, right? I'm um, just curious, Yemi, we'll start with you, but everybody's same question. What's next for all of you as you continue on this journey of conscious capitalism? Um, there's a business one, there's a personal one. The business one is my business partner and I, uh, we really want to formalize our de development plan. So have a step-by-step -step mm. plan to invite our staff into. And close, re close, closely related to that is to also explore what it looks like for staff to invite them into ownership of the business. Mm. 